The first thing uh, that is important to, to realize when we deal with portrait, it is that there's, there's kind of a, a pull in two directions, I would say. The first direction is obvious. You cannot make a portrait if you don't try to make a very clear likeness of the model. Uh, after all, a portrait represents an individual. And if you don't succeed to do that, of course, you, you are not a portraitist. If you give just a general figure of human, it's not a portrait. Uh, this is the first thing. And I, I was struck by a text by Baudelaire uh, who says about this, he says there's two kind of painters. There's some you could compare them to historian and they will represent in minute details their model uh, as if it was facts, you know, and they want to, uh, the way to get to the individual, if you want, it is really to represent it like this in all these details and very accurately and all that. And he says others are like novelists. So they are more detached maybe of this, uh, of this effort to represent every little details, but they try to convey also the individual, but in a more general way. And to illustrate this, he quotes for the historian, let's say, Ingres. And of course, it's a good, it's a good example because this man here, this uh, Louis-Francois Bertin, who is like the epitome of the bourgeoisie. You see, you cannot have a better bourgeois than that. In fact, he was not <laughs> such a bourgeois. He was a journalist huh? and rather uh, uh, active, uh, rather politically involved in all that. And, but he, he looks ominous there. He looks uh, sure of himself and all that. But wh what Baudelaire suggested in this type of representation, you do have a kind of uh, historian point of view, you see, trying to be close to the facts and to represent anything that could be typical of this man, even if he, his hair are not come properly. Uh, I don't want to attract the fact that my hair have been cut recently, but... <laughs> 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 but it, it strikes me looking at a picture that this is one of the elements to, to go closely to, uh, to all these details. And the Fontaine Latour self-portrait will be the other, the more novelist type of approach. But in both cases, you have this importance given to the individual. Even if you have different style, the individual is the core of this representation. Uh, but the other thing also, it's important, I think, to try to find a certain level of cer certain aspect of permanency in the figure that you are uh, making the portrait of. If you have only these detail, only the individual, you will have a portrait who have not too much interest in a way. Every great portraitist have tried to do something else with it, try to find some level let's say, of generalization, of universalization that will make, okay, it's an individual, but it's also something else, it's also more permanent than that. Uh, and uh, let's see, that to illustrate this, the trap of getting too, too much to the emotion of the, uh, of the model, it is that you may lose this permanent aspect. Uh, if you are too interested just to show, well, a, a kid now smiling and the other having pain and all that, then this will take over on this more permanent aspect of the figure that you have to grope for also if you make a, a, a great portrait. Uh, the, the, you see, there's this individualist aspect, but also this permanent aspect. Both have to be kept together. Let's see here in this uh, Giovanni Francesco Carotto, uh, he's not a very well-known painter. I have no idea who he is, except that he was born in Verona and probably in the 17th century or something. But um, what is interesting here, it is, uh, is it a portrait of a kid showing a drawing or is it rather, I would say, a genre type of painting in which the kid is not important here. It is to make mockery about the fact that he thinks that this drawing is fantastic and is beautiful. Because of course, in the 17th century, nobody give a damn of, of children drawings. Huh? Today, we, we glue them on our frigidaire and we, we devote a lot of attention to them. Oh, it's so beautiful and all that, but we, sometimes we don't believe it, but we, we do. But in the 17th century, for, for sure, this was seen as a kind of, uh, something to mock at or something to, to laugh at. Uh, and uh, probably what they suggest also, it is that it's a self-portrait that a kid is showing to you. Uh, it's, it's how he sees himself. And if, if, you, if you analyze it in that way, it becomes a, a, a tableau de genre. Uh, it's like uh, just a way to, to express uh, one little 
aspect of, of life, of, uh, let's say, of uh, human uh, frailty, I would say. In the other, in the Caravaggio, the same idea, except that instead of uh, being the expression of joy, of, uh, of pleasure and all that, it's rather of pain. Huh? It's, a, it's a boy bitten by a lizard, and uh, Caravaggio, with all his uh, extremely uh, uh, powerful way to translate emotion and feelings, uh, have m made of this little event, if you want, a fantastic study you, where, where you see the, the face uh, with the brows frown and the, the open mouth. You almost hear him say, ouch. Huh? You, you, you hear him uh, reacting. Mind you, what is more difficult to see there is the lizard, huh? but he's there somewhere. Uh, I don't know if you, you see, this is the finger that is hurt. <laughs> and the lizard somewhere the, down there. It's a little animal, nothing to, to be afraid of and all that. It's not poisonous, not dangerous. But he wanted to take advantage of that to make a study of, uh, of uh, pain, uh, of all the, for instance, even this right hand who goes like this in the back. Uh, it, it's going to be a reaction to you are bitten by something and you do like this. Uh. All this is very well observed. We think that even it's, an auto, it's a self-portrait of Caravaggio, uh, that he used himself in front of a mirror to analyze these, uh, these effects of pain on him. But again, if it's the emotion who take over, the self-portrait there disappear in a certain way. Uh, it's more like a peinture de genre also, like the other one, than a portrait. Uh, you see the... So, of course, it's interesting to explore these emotions and for the, the, the painter of that period also because they, they need it for their historical painting and for their religious painting. They, know, they need to, to study these things. But, but then you escape the realm of the portrait because you are dealing with fleeting uh, aspect of the human face, huh? uh, a feeling that will appear and disappear very rapidly. Like uh, if this little boy is scorned by, by his drawing, he will be sad. And if the, the, the guy sh shake the lizard from his, uh, he will laugh maybe. They, uh, so it's a very unpermanent type of uh, expression that are not interesting for a portraitist. Uh, we try to, to get something more fundamental than that. And the the, what will be seen as the more fundamental aspect, well, will depend on, on many factors. Today, I want to deal with a kind of uh, uh, touchy subject, maybe a little bit, because the permanency that the artist will be trying to get could be defined as the ethnic character of his personage. Uh, so he will want to show an individual but also that belongs to an ethnic group who will be really well defined in the, in the portrait. Uh, then I think it's a good example of what I was saying. You have the individual aspect, but the permanent aspect here will be his ethnic character, or to, to use a word that I don't like, but to have an immense importance in terms of history, if you want, the race, uh, uh, the race of the subject matter. And uh, this, then many artists thought, well, this is the structure of the face that we should probe, that we should try to get, and then to add to this certain individual characteristic that will make it a portrait of this black man, of this black woman, of this Indian, of this uh, whoever. Uh, so this will be our first uh, exp example that day of that. And then I want, in subsequent uh, lecture, we will deal with uh, uh, a definition of uh, more psychological definition of character. Uh, this idea that you have different type, different physiognomy. Uh, somebody who is lethargic, and somebody who is very lively, sanguine, or, or whatever. Th this type of, of approach in which you will try to find in a face certain character, psychological then, will be permanent, will be very characteristic of this uh, individual. You will see it's all, also in, ambiguous. And later on, the, the three last lecture will be one about, let's see, the occupation. Or can we... Uh, attribute to one portrait certain traits, that certain uh, element, if you want, that will reveal what this man is doing uh, or what this woman is, is doing by uh, his costume, maybe, by the way uh, his, his face is worn out by the sun and whatever it, it does. Then class could be also an element. And finally, a definition of row, of power, if you want, could be a, a third element. So you see, each time we will deal with a portrait of individual, but also where the artist try to express something else that he feel is more permanent. Okay, we will, so we will start uh, today by 
some portrait of black people in Canadian art. You don't have many of them, but you do have a few attempts by artists. And this was probably one of the most famous one and the most uh, earlier one, I, I would say, done by a man who was called Francois Malepart de Beaucourt, with a name like this, you see, you always already make your career. That's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Francois Malepart de Beaucourt. And uh, it's, it's a portrait of a black slave, uh, 1786. The date here, and it's, uh, you can see it at the McCord Museum, so it's not too far from me. Uh, the date here is interesting. 1786, you, you, you ask yourself, there, there is still black slave in Canada at the time? And we know, for instance, uh, that uh, already in the United States, certain states have abolished slavery. Uh, for instance, in the Rhode Island, already in 1774. In Virginia, 1776. Uh, like ten years before that painting, and uh, in Massachusetts, in 1780. So already in uh, uh, among our neighbors in the South, slavery was abolished one state after the other, and finally uh, at the federal level, if you want. But but even in 1787, so that means one year after that painting, we have discovered not me but uh, Monsieur Trudel who made a wonderful book about l'esclavage au Canada français. Uh, it's a fascinating book because it reveals an aspect that we never suspect. For instance, that even priests at the time had slaves. Uh, I didn't know that. I read that in Trudel. Monseigneur so and so have uh, three slaves uh, to help him to uh, to dress. I don't know to to and as if it was. Uh, all, uh, absolutely normal. Huh? But in 1787, what Trudel uh, gave us as an example, it's a market, uh, it's a, if you want, it's, a, it's a, a document in which a man says, okay, I'm ready to pay 750 pounds for Mrs. Cindy here, which is a black girl that he wants to buy, really. And he says, in case the, uh, the parliament or the government decide to abolish slavery, you have to give him back my money. Huh? And, and as if it was really like a, a contract like this. And the fact that uh, the seller, the guy who sells the little girl to him, uh, I think she was 10 years old, yeah, for 750 pounds. That's quite a lot of money. But the fact that this guy had no problem to sell it, to sell these little girls to this man, prove that he didn't believe that the parliament will, leg will legislate on this. Uh, and indeed, nothing happened. There's no legislation in Canada of abolishing the slavery. It didn't exist. And uh, so, for instance, in 1784, there's a census made. There's 304 slaves in Canada still. They are aging, they are disappearing, some are replaced, and some, and apparently what, what happened in Canada, it is slavery disappeared with the slaves. No more slaves, no more slavery. There was never a parliament who, who thought that it was important enough to, to uh, leg uh, legislate on this and to make laws on this. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's an aspect which, which is troubling and also maybe very typical of Canadian politics. You see. You just let it go, you will see. <laughs> so you, you let things uh, just rot like this slowly and, and, and they disappear. Uh, no, <laughs> no comment. Okay, the, uh, the, 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 so in 1786, that Beaucourt did this portrait of, uh, probably of his, of his slave, uh, of somebody who worked for him. Uh, it's, when you put it in the context, it's perfectly plausible, and we know that this woman was still alive in 1832, so probably she saw uh, this kind of dwindling of, of slavery in Canada, but being always attached to her master and, and never being really free, if you want, even if she dies so late, uh, 1832. She's represented here with uh, fruits that uh, is associated with the West Indies, of course, uh, the, like the pineapple, the mango, and also what is disturbing, at least to me, uh, and Harper have made the notice also, she have one breast naked and the other, so th this, what it is behind this, of course, it is that the, uh, this black woman 
had the kind of reputation of sensuality, of sexuality, if you want. And this is, is, is certainly what, what you want to suggest here. Uh, that, uh, and also that she have a big smile like this, as if no, they, I, nothing happened. I just show it a little bit. That, and uh, as if uh, see, it was uh, Alain de Soie, if you want. I think this is already uh, ambiguous and ambivalent. I mentioned that because this is an old prejudice about that black women are more sexually uh, uh, active than white and things like that. Of course, it's a pure projection of white male. Uh, <laughs> only in white male brain that this thing could, could, uh, could happen. But, but this is, this is uh, certainly one of the aspects. The other aspect, and I want to make a parallel with the, another type of painting here that we don't know the painter who did it, anonymous, if you want. Well, John Mellor's Black Coach Boy this is uh, underlined another aspect of this type of portrait. This John Miller have asked a kind of, uh, I would say, a, uh, a visitor painter in his village or in his town to make the portrait of his slaves, of all of them. Uh, and then it's almost like if you represent your property. Uh, the same impulse will make also these people having their, their castle or their mansion painted by the painter also paint my belongings, and among them, you have my slaves. Uh, and uh, e even in college like Cambridge and Oxford, uh, rich uh, students, you see, used to have portraits of their slave like this. Uh, and and this, is, this is another aspect of it. It is like the relationship with these people is like with property, like a thing. Uh, and you represent it just to show how rich you are. And, and, and of course, Beaucourt is not a naive painter like the one who did that, but the intention could be very similar also. I show uh, that I'm well off because I have slaves, and I show you my favorite one or whatever. I made a portrait of her. Because how to explain, in fact, this uh, idea of making a portrait of a black slave? Huh? If not, it, to show uh, your belongings, to show your property. Then, of course, the problem is how do you represent a, a black person uh, in a convincing way, if you want? This, if you, if you look at the tradition in art history with that, you do have in the past some uh, great artists who have made convincing picture of, uh, let's say, a black slave, in, uh, even in the 16th century, like Dürer here, that you, I made this portrait of this Katharina, he called Katharina the Moor, because the Moor comes from North Africa. And, uh, and I find Dürer here more respectful of this person than our Boucour. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it, you see, she, she looks shy, she looks not so sure, but he doesn't, he doesn't exploit her, he doesn't mock at her. Uh, uh, you have, uh, for instance, certainly uh, people like Rubens could, could make uh, 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 head of a black man on four stage here on the left, and he used it, if you want, in this uh, picture. Well, this is not for the, uh, the Lacordaire, um, but <laughs> you see he's here. Uh, you know what the Lacordaire is. It's, it's a group of people who don't want to drink. Uh, so uh, I, I don't recommend. <laughs> it's a drunk Bacchus, really with a huge stomach, uh, will stumbling and all that, and with a group of people around, even I, uh, whoops, I'm sorry, that, uh, this wonderful device. Here, uh, this is also, uh, only Rubens could imagine a thing like that, but anyway. The, uh, but, okay, then you have, you have a painter who could, who could make this type of representation and then use it in a, uh, a kind of uh, representation like uh, the one we have on the right. But the, very often, the problem of representing a black man in a painting, if you look back to the tradition, was in the representation of the three wise men uh, of the uh, gospel. You know the story, there's three guys come from we don't know where and give uh, the most uh, incredible gift and, and ridiculous, in fact, it's a, a, to a baby, you give gold, you give incense and mira. What you will do with it, I have no idea. But the, anyway, so, so they came with, with these gifts, and they are supposed to represent each one a different country, if you want, Asia, Africa, and Europe. Uh, of course, America doesn't exist uh, at that stage. And okay, so they have always one of the wise men who is black, 
you know, like the one you see on the right here. Um, and very often, the feeling you get, it is that a white man have posed for it, for, for, for this picture, and have been colored in black after. Huh? And this struck uh, one man who's called Petrus Camper, and he will be at the origin, let's say, of uh, giving the rules to represent a black uh, face in a convincing way. Uh, Petrus Camper is an anatomist, He's a sculptor also, is of exactly contemporary of Boucourt, let's say, so the end of 18th century, beginning of 19th. And it's him who have invented this uh, notion of facial angle. Uh, you have it here quite clearly uh, delimited, if you want. Uh, you have, if you take a line that uh, starts from the nostril and goes to the opening of the ear, you have a kind of baseline. And then if you take another line, it goes from the eyebrows to the, uh, uh, let's see, the bone here that we have in our mouth, just above the, the upper lips, if you want. Then you get an angle, uh, which is called the facial angle. And Camber says this is, this is the first thing you have to get if you want to make a, 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 um, a black face convincing. Okay, this, okay, you could say this, maybe it's a little bit strange, but it's understandable. Maybe he, he had good intention. And Camper is not a racist. I, I, I insist on that because you will see that he will be used, of course, by racists. Then he made another type of comparison who's, who's much less uh, well inspired, huh? in which he put a chimpanzee at the beginning a black man and a white man, to show this variation of this ang facial angle. Uh, here, of course, it's very sharp, very uh, narrow, if you want. Here is the picture we had just before. Uh, and, uh, and finally, here, not only the, uh, the white man have a, a kind of a right angle as a facial angle, but always almost tilted a little bit further than right angle. Uh, it's like if you, you are not 90, 90 degrees, you are 100 degrees. So then you have really a big brain. Huh? You are at the top of the, of the, the scale there. Huh? And he, he did finally this picture is even worse, in which you start with a monkey, you get to primitive people, black and primitive people, let's see, found in archaeology, and finally the white, and, f and even further, the Apollo Belvedere. Huh? And all the, see, the, this famous culture that uh, uh, with always the, 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 the perfect Greek profile and all that. Huh? And the, I says that Cam, uh, Campery was not a racist. He says that th these drawings should not be used to classify people and to, to find some more important, uh, some superior and some inferior. But of course, you can imagine what happened with these type of drawings. Huh? And uh, I will give you just two examples of that. Uh, you have uh, here a book, uh, by Jules Viré, a French uh, nobody, in fact. Were, all these names should be forgotten, uh, absolutely. They, they should never be <laughs> remembered because they're a bunch of imbeciles. But anyway, <laughs> the Histoire naturelle du genre humain, in which you see exactly what he, what he kept from Camper uh, studies, the Apollo of Belvedere on the top, the black, and the monkey. Uh, and then it's repeated in this book by these two guys who are, who are anthropologists, well, mind you, of the uh, end of the 19th century, but we are supposed to have made a kind of scientific book about that, and they repeat the same thing. But more than that, they have, uh, where is my little device? Anyway, I will, I will go to it. If you look here, the skull of the uh, chin is almost closer to the skull of the white on the top, and the skull of the black, we call it negro, so the, is, is like tilted, and the, uh, the, uh, the lower jaw is even more advanced. And very often you find in this type of presentation also a lot of praise about the intelligence of monkey and the brutishness of black people in order that they will be cl the closer possible together. And in, in terms of anatomy, this is completely false, of course. Uh, the, this idea of uh, having the, the skull of the chimp more as big as the one of, uh, of the white man, it, it, it's, it's false. But, but these data are twisted in a, in a way to prove their point that the black race is inferior uh, uh, to the white one. And, and this is, will, you will see, 
it's one of the, of the trap, of course, of any artist who gets interested in this type of subject. They are walking, literally, on a kind of very mine ground uh, in which how can you do it properly and all that. And uh, I wanted to give you this context and the importance of this Petrus Camper as the one who really initiated this, uh, this type of representation in order to put it in, in, in their context. If we now we go back to our subject, let's say, of Canadian art and try to see uh, some example closer to us in time of uh, this representation of black people. Uh, first example is Old Gate. Uh, we mentioned him last time. You remember I show you his self-portrait. And uh, he was uh, uh, from a family who had some belonging in Jamaica. Yeah? And after the war in 1919, he went there and uh, to relax after the war and all that. And he have painted, of course, uh, subject matter in Jamaica, landscape, but also, uh, like here, an example of uh, what he call a young coolie girl in Jamaica. Uh, she's represented in kind of minimum of landscape, but there is something behind her. Huh? There's these two, uh, they were interpreted like bamboo, but it could be also sugar cane, huh? because after all, Jamaica is, uh, it was a kind of a colony where uh, sugar w was uh, exploited. And she have maybe behind her here, maybe a kind of minimum of a chair or something to, to show. So, so that is a certain context in which she presented. For the rest, of course, he tried to make an image as clear as possible, contrasted, you see, the black skin with the white robe, uh, with the white gown, and, and to make uh, it uh, as convincible as possible. But then, OK, if you have only this example, it's hard to know exactly what Holgate uh, thought about his relationship, let's say, with this type of subject. Was he uh, uh, slightly racialist, if you, not to use the word racist? But there is, I think, a kind of troubling image that I want to show in that context by him also. This is him in 1919 when he was in Jamaica, looking like a like a chudla with boots and things like that. But, but the, what I want to attract your attention is on this engraving on the right. Two uh, critics uh, that I respect, one is uh, Marie Tovel and the other is Esther Trepanier. Two women have uh, described this engraving like very pleasant, as if it was a kind of intermingling of human body with uh, plants and don't find too much problem with it. And I was surprised because I, I'm disturbed by the fact that you have naked black girls in trees. Uh, and uh, even if it's beautifully drawn or whatever, the subject matter is, is disturbing. Because this is, of course, one of the, one of the implications that we had before in this uh, more racist type of stuff where, where you compare uh, black people to, to chimps or to chimpanzee. Uh. So there you, you may have suddenly a, a, a place where all gates are crossing the, the, the border. Uh, you don't feel that in, in his portrait of a coolie girl, but then suddenly in one of his engraving, you have this kind of more disturbing type of subject matter. Uh. Another example of this uh, attempt to depict black will be done by this uh, uh, this painter was called Prudence Hayward. I show you just uh, a typical painting. Uh, it, we, it belongs here to the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, so you can see it on, on the wall. The date is 1928, uh, uh, and the, the collection, uh, it's uh, Museum of Fine Arts, Montreal. Uh, Prudence Hayward is. Uh, come from a very wealthy family of Montreal. And uh, she have studies under Breimner. I don't know if this uh, details uh, make any sense to you, but let's say Breimner was responsible of the art school here in the museum at the time. Huh? And then she went to Paris, to Calarossi. So she really have kind of a, the upbringing that we would expect of any girls with uh, some talent and uh, some money also. In uh, Paris, she lived in Hotel Lutetia. This was like living in the, the Ritz here. So there's somebody who has some class and money <laughs> and could afford to do this. And uh, she, she had a bad health, and she died relatively, relatively young in 1947. 
but she made also a lot of travels, and in, especially in Bermuda. And there, from, from there, she came back with this type of picture, in which, again, you have a black woman in nature, uh, associated with nature. Yeah? It is like the third time we see that. If you want in Boku, you have this little still life nearby with plants that were representing the West Indies. In the uh, Jamaican girl of Old Gate, you have this kind of sugar cane or bamboo or whatever behind her. Here again, you have these plants, these exotic plants that we don't know much about, who are circling this girl. But then maybe because Prudence Edward was herself uh, a suffering person uh, in terms of her health, let's say, uh, she has a certain empathy to, to her, and she doesn't uh, give the impression of as much detachment, let's say, that we have in the Holgate painting. Uh, with the Holgate painting, you think, okay, this is the subject that he chose to do. He do it properly, he knows, he knows his craft, and he's more interested in structure, in composition, and all that. Here you feel a certain empathy between the model and, and, uh, and what she represented. Uh. So I think that was also a, kind of an interesting example of this attempt of some of our artists of, to represent the uh, uh, a black girl that see like, like we are the the uh, always see see the uh, what i was mentioning in the beginning huh? it's portrait of an individual but what is permanent in this individual according to these painter it is their uh, let's say racial characteristic uh, so they try to to put the two together in one painting the other obvious subject also for Canadian art of this type, it is the representation of First Nations. Uh, and this, of course, there's an immense uh, uh, amount of picture of that. I, I could not even uh, evoke in one lecture uh, all the complexity of this subject matter, but I want to, to show you a little bit some example of that. We could make about the uh, First Nation representation the same type of reasoning I made about the black. That means there was the same challenge at the beginning, how to represent these people. Nobody knew. Uh, if you go very far in time and you look, for instance, on a map by Samuel de Champlain, a representation of two Indians, according to him, uh, you call it figure des sauvages. Alors, des sauvages is wild men, uh, the, the savages, almushikwa. The, uh, the sauvages almushikwa for Champlain are people living on the Atlantic coast, let's say, uh, south of uh, New Brunswick, somewhere in Upper Maine, or in that region, more or less. Huh? And uh, what he wants to show us, it is that these people are already able to cultivate plant. Huh? And he was very surprised by that, because Champlain uh, thought, that, like anybody at this time, that a savage, uh, a wild man, doesn't know agriculture at all. He, he's just uh, running in the forest and, and hunting, and he have nothing to do with, with agriculture. And he find these uh, more sophisticated people in that region, and he was very surprised of that. So he gave to the woman uh, this important role, you see, of holding maybe what is a squash in her left hand near me. And the thing who looks like a tulip, so I don't know what, is in fact a representation of corn. Huh? And it proved, of course, that he didn't see much of it at the time. <laughs> uh, corn is introduced slowly in, in Europe. Huh? Maybe Champlain saw corn, but the engraver who do that didn't see it. Okay? Because Champlain will probably make a little drawings for him, and he give it to him, and he says, make, make the best of it. And then the engraver, we know the name of this guy, is David Pelletier, never came in America, never saw a corn in the cob uh, in his life, for sure. And in fact, because this plant was introduced from the south of Europe uh, in the 16th century, from Spain and Portugal, and slowly creeped toward the north. Uh, and uh, at the beginning, it was seen as an ornamental plant. You, you, you put one corn plant in your garden just as an exotic thing, say, as we will do a, a palm tree, let's say, or something. One, see, we don't need too much of that. We don't eat this also, and animal, nobody eats this. It's just strange, and it's uh, like le blé d'Inde. Huh? It's the, 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 the wheat of India. Or, the, or they have also the grano turchi. Uh, it's the, the, in, in Italian, it's a grano turchi. Uh, the, the grain who come from Turkey. Uh, who come from far, and bizarre. 
okay. So it takes time that, to realize that. And of course, there is the opposition who is very European between the woman who is, uh, uh, with food, uh, the, who is a food giver, and the man with arms, uh, who is a warrior. Uh, you, you have, and he looks at, but what is striking here, if you look at their face, uh, he looks like, uh, I would say, Henry IV, huh? <laughs> he, uh, with his little pinch like that. If you isolate his head completely, you will not, you will not know that he, it, it wanted to be an Indian or to be a, a First Nation representative. And the same for the, the woman. Huh? She had a little bit uh, Hondotrish style, <laughs> I don't know what, but she, uh, she had nothing to... So at that time, you would see in 17th century, this... Uh, uh, come from a map of 1612, uh, the concept of race doesn't exist. Uh, no, nobody think in, in those terms. They, they, mind you, they make a very strong hierarchy among people because the savage is like the lower grade that you can have. Lower than that is beast. Uh, and uh, so a little bit savages, and then above them you have the poor people, above them you have the bourgeois, the people who live in, in, in city, and above them the noble, and on the top the king, of course. So you have a kind of pyramidal uh, division of uh, society like this, but not in terms of race, uh, which is very different. In fact, for the Indian, we have to wait a little bit further in time, I would say even uh, at the uh, 19th century, to see uh, representing or, or attempt to represent more graphically and more accurately, let's say, uh, prim uh, the, uh, the uh, Première Nation, the First Nation people. Okay. And the, the great responsible of, of that is this guy, George S. Morton. He collected about 1,000 human skull. Uh, what an idea. Anyway, he had uh, the, these, his friends call his office uh, Golgotha, in which you have all these skulls like this, most of them coming from the Americas. Yeah. So he, he, he did publish, finally, a book which is called Crania Americana uh, in 1839, which was illustrated by a fantastic lithograph, in fact, uh, very, very, uh, almost like photo, if you want, by this John Collins, who is not well known, but certainly an, an, an interesting uh, drawer, let's say. And uh, what Morton wanted to prove with his collection of skull, it is that there was a hierarchy between the races. And what he did, he says a skull is like um, an empty space in which there was a brain before. Huh? So we could maybe, by measuring the, the skull, having an idea of different size of brain of different races, and then classify them. Uh, this is a very <laughs> stupid type of thing. So how do you measure empty space? Uh, so he had this idea of putting bobbering in his skulls, uh, little balls in, in lead, and then shaking them well, and then pouring them in a kind of measuring cup and deciding, well, this black man have 100 grams of little bobbering, and this white man have 200 of them. So it's clear that one has a small brain and the other has a big one. Uh, you see, I caricaturize a little bit, but that's the way he established fact. And he says, I'm sure of my data because I repeat my measurement many times. Huh? When Stephen Jay Gold, where I took this uh, story, says, he says, he, I spent a summer to check on Morton data. And he says, it was terrible. He was fing, fing, fingaling, it was fudging his, his result in order to get to what he wanted to, to prove that white man is on the top and black man is, in, is at the bottom and in between the, the Indians. Yeah, that's very convenient to have the three states. Even when he measured white people, he got, by azar, I would say, by pure science, the Anglo-Saxon on the top, the Jews in the middle, and the Hindu in the bottom. <laughs> this is very imperialistic, of course. I, I see 19th century uh, English man, you know, this is perfectly where, where it's absolute truth, you know, this is scientific. Huh? So Morton have this kind of agenda, let's say. I, Jay Gould says, in unconsciously, he says, I don't think he did it on purpose, but he had so much this structure already in his approach, let's say, that, of course, the data have to be organized to, to, to demonstrate what he wants to do. So, again, you have, in this uh, type of uh, 
let's say, of this period, you have again this type of prejudices when you deal with this theme of race, and we will find it also expressed in painting. Uh, the, the, the one who will be more interested in this subject matter and will try to uh, entice Canadian painter to treat him will be an anthropologist who's called Marius Barbeau. Uh, Barbeau was working for the Museum of uh, what will be now the Museum of Man, but at the time it was the uh, National Museum of Canada in Ottawa. And uh, he was, like many anthropologists of his days, let's see, in the 1920s, he was absolutely uh, convinced that the First Nation were uh, disappearing nations. He thought uh, it's a question of time. They will, be, uh, they will vanish completely from, from the herd. The competition with white man is too strong. They will never survive. And then he was interested also in their art because he says, after all, it's part of our uh, own uh, Canadian, let's say, patrimony. Uh, the, uh, the art of the Indian should be saved, should be kept. And he thought to, uh, let's say, to... Uh, foster this idea of, uh, that one of the source of Canadian art could be what the uh, Indian have done. Uh, one, one of the sort that will make a distinct Canadian art, will make us different from the other if, if we took inspiration from their art. So that was another motivation also to keep the, their art. So then he says, okay, I have to have some artists who are ready to make commercial image that will encourage the people to donate and to be enthusiastic for this type of project. Huh? So the, the one he liked best was this American painter, Langan Kin, and I don't know, uh, people of my age may remember, in the National Geographic magazine uh, in, this, uh, in the 50s, let's say not to be too cruel, uh, <laughs> You had uh, this Langdon Kin have made illustration in the National Geographic like this, and as kids, I remember I, I used to like it and to to live through it and say, "Wow, this is fantastic!" See, we, we had we play cowboy and Indian, of course, and we wanted to know how the Indian looks. So Langdon Kin was our, and Barbo had a lot of enthusiasm for his work. Huh? Like, for instance, this is a typical painting of his. He's more an illustrator than a painter. Huh? Uh, I don't think nobody knows uh, today who Langan Kin is, uh, except uh, an illustrator for National Geographic for, uh, in, in the 40s, 50s. Uh, uh, and, and then he tried to convince other Canadian painters to do the same. And all this, at the end, will end up in a big exhibition in 1927, where uh, he tried to put, in parallel, native and modern uh, uh, artists, let's say. Uh, and this was at the National Gallery at the time. Uh, of course, it was not where it is now, as you can see by, by the display. It was um, what we, call, we used to call the Victoria Museum uh, on Mel Castle in, in Ottawa, uh, which have been transformed. At the time, I remember the uh, National Gallery was divided in two parts. You have the uh, you enter and you have the buffaloes, uh, stuff, uh, and uh, you have the animals and dinosaurs, and then you shift to another room and you have art. Uh, it was all together, if you want, the, what is divided between the Museum of Man and, and uh, National Gallery and all that today. But at the time, it was all together. So it's one of the rooms. And Barbo had this idea of confronting, let's say, in the same room, some sculpture by uh, West Coast Indians and modern art, well, what the uh, Emily Carr, let's say, Olgate, and all these people. Huh? And in this uh, picture, you could see here in the corner four, uh, the, uh, where is this little thing? Oh, uh, four drawings here by Olgate. Huh? And uh, when they were done, well, Barbo brought Olgate and Jackson with him, A.Y. Jackson, he's a famous painter of the Group of Seven on the Skeena River, uh, so that means in the north of British Columbia, a place where now accessible at the time because the railway was done since 1914, and so they could go there relatively easily. The only thing, it was a little bit costly, but Barbo obtained for the painters a free pass and they could go there. Uh, so they come with him and they visit village to village, and Olgate was certainly interested and make some drawings on the spot, and these were used after in this big show of 1927. Uh, I, I can reconstruct more or less uh, 
the uh, drawings of uh, Olgate that you saw on the previous picture, you have this old woman and then two chiefs like this, one above the other, and there was a fourth one that I didn't uh, uh, succeed to, to, uh, to retrieve, uh, to, to find. But anyway, you see a little bit the type of drawings and, and the type of display also, huh? one above the others and two symmetrical like this. I think if I go back, uh, you would, oops, uh, you will see that the, the one who's completely on the right, It was a strange exhibition. Uh, you, you have a fantastic description of the opening by Emily Carr, uh, because she's invited by Barbo to, to go, and she says, I had the feeling that uh, we came too early. There was nobody. But in fact, uh, we were in time, and there was not much crowd, she said. And she says, I was happy that the depiction of Indian there showed people who were blind because they could not see the horror of this. Uh. And uh, so Emily Carr, of course, was very close to, to the First Nations she, and uh, in her feelings and all that. And, and it was, and, and Barbu, with all his good intention, I'm sure he wanted really to, uh, to make this art known and to create also this kind of dialogue uh, between the heart of the First Nation and, and the Canadian modern artists in order to create a typically Canadian uh, idiom, let's say, to, to distinguish ourselves from Europe, from, everybody, from the States, uh, by, by this type of dialogue. But uh, in fact, you, you feel more a kind of juxtaposition of teams and not a real integration of both. Some journalists have noticed it, but uh, it, it's ev very evident when, when you see how the show is organized. So the, for instance, I just will give you a little bit of data on this picture, let's say, of this chief was uh, called Kaum Wallace, huh? and uh, he is known to, to have been very, very distant and very despiteful of uh, Olgate and Barbo. Uh, for instance, when Barbo spoke with him through an interpret, he never looked at him. Uh, he looked just like, like you see him. And the same with, with Olgate. Uh, Olgate could not have him facing him. He, he had to make a profile like this. Why this, okay, you say, well, these people are chief, are very sure of their uh, hierarchy, but there was another problem. There's a problem of uh, being invaded by tourists at the time for, for these First Nations. What happened with this railway that I mentioned, there's a lot of people who come there. For instance, we know that one of the village of the Skeena River in 1928 was the most photographed place after Niagara Falls in Canada. Uh, so that means a lot of people went there and took picture and of uh, Indians, you see, this is great, well, savage people, pst, and then we take picture there, we'll bring it back, and we'll look at it carefully in our uh, living rooms uh, without any, any problem. And, the, uh, and so you had this tourist movement, and also the, one of the things that Barbu wanted to do to, to make a tourist attraction with that was to renew the, to, the, the two temples there. So they were re-erected, they were repainted, and they were brought near the railways, you see, in order to, Oh, look, when we pass in the railway, we should stop there. And so one of these chiefs tell, tell Barbo, he says, what is this? He says, a few years ago, you asked us to destroy these totem poles. Of course, because then it was a, a tentative to assimilate uh, the First Nation and to destroy all traces of their own culture. And he says, now you want to, us to repaint it? So make up your mind. Uh, this was a good question, by the way, uh, because it, it makes us suspect a little bit the intention behind all this. Uh, it seems like a way to save Indian art and all that, but it's also a way to attract tourists to a region where what you see, in fact, is just their art. The people themselves doesn't count, are disappearing and all. And uh, so you, you just have this art to, to make uh, part of the Canadian patrimony, if you want, and that's what you want to display. Uh, uh, the, the reason why Olgate was interested to this type of picture can be found in his own upbringing. Uh, for instance, when he was in Paris to study, he was very much interested by this uh, uh, Russian painter, Alexander Yakovlev, that uh, was known as a kind of realistic uh, painter, as you can see, and who had been traveling a lot in China, in, uh, in uh, Africa, and came back with this type of picture. 
And what is common between this picture and what we saw already of uh, the, the few examples we saw already of Old Gate, it is that they are created the same way. You have just a personage without any context. Huh? You don't have any uh, background, if you want. He's like uh, in front of a sheet of paper and is uh, isolated like this, just as without any context, I would say, without any history also, nor past, nor future. He's just standing there as a type, uh, as, for instance, a Chinese man or as a black girl uh, from Africa, and, and isolated like that. And you have an example of that also in some of early drawings of Old Gate, when he went in Brittany and made this old peasant, uh, a Breton peasant, and his wife, exactly the same thing, with using more or less the same technique, and also on a white background without any context, just creating a type, a typical type of a, somebody from Bretagne uh, at the time. And uh, when you see then how he painted, uh, let's see, this chief, who is uh, uh, called uh, Wee Hengla, Hengwa, uh, which uh, was painted in all these regalia, I would say. You have his headpiece uh, with the Thunderbird uh, subject matter on his head and with Habalon uh, uh, incrustation. And then you have this Chilkat cover uh, that he is uh, covered with, who is painted all this very realistically. And, and of course, the chief is blind. He will die one year after that the painting was done. And in this case, we have an incredible document in which you see the type of, uh, of setting that Holgate imposed on him to make the drawing that you see on the left. Huh? What is striking there, it is first of all, he asked him to be sitting above, huh? to give an impression that we are in front of somebody who is uh, uh, than, uh, say higher than us, uh, looking like this. And then the other thing, of course, is the white sheet behind him, huh? which is, of course, a way to eliminate the surrounding completely and eliminate also, I would say, even his own history. Uh, he is living in a kind of uh, empty space, and it's m stressed even more by the fact that he's, he's dressed in a kind of ceremonial dress. Uh, he imposed on him not to be like every day, uh, to be dressed like every day, uh, like uh, if nothing happened, but to put this, he says, maybe for the last time, this regalia, this big costume uh, that, uh, of course, is not used habitually by the chief, like this, uh, for just for sitting, they are, they are costumes that they use in dancing. Uh, that's why they have a fringe that he doesn't show, but that you can see on the, on the photo. Uh, and uh, this fringe, when they dance, of course, make a fantastic movement around them. And, and, uh, and to, to be sitting like this, of course, it's also to put him outside of context. And by stressing the ceremonial dress, of course, he stressed almost this kind of uh, weird space in his story where there's no, no future, no past, it's somewhere else. It's like, and like if you, you remove all the roots of these people and you reduce them to a pure image. So these drawings are not so innocent, in fact. If you analyze them a little bit, and you see also the dependence of Yakovlev, how this type of of uh, representation is very typical of the 30s where you have all still a, a very strong colonialism everywhere. And uh, th so they, they have this idea of just keeping like a shell, I would say, the uh, faces of these people and without uh, evoking any type of context. And to, to finish this uh, presentation, I thought of why not to speak of another race <laughs> that is closer to us and uh, of, of uh, the attempt of some artists to make a representation of typical of French Canadian. <laughs> I said, well, why not to turn the, the spot on us, on me, let's say. But the, the guy who is most responsible of this type of approach is this Lionel Grou. Huh? Uh, you may know him just because there's a metro station named after him, but I will tell you a little bit who he was. He was um, a priest, of course, and uh, even a chanoine. Uh, so this is a little bit higher in the hierarchy. A chanoine have a kind of violet uh, uh, belt like this. Uh, the only difference, of course, with priests, but he have this thing here. And uh, if he was a bishop, he will have more of it. Uh, he will be more red. But anyway, so they have a hierarchy like this. And, and chanoine Gru was an historian, and he was also a, a very strong nationalist. 
And he was interested in one question, how a new race get born? Uh, what, is, uh, will make, what is the condition that we will see a new race? And of course, what he was thinking, a new race of, uh, uh, of people living in America, of French speaking, of Can a French Canadian, that's it. And his source to, to, of reflection on this was um, a French philosopher, it's called Hippolyte Ten, T-A-I-N-E. Ten is not the most important philosopher, but let's say Ten have this idea that race was a kind of a, almost indestructible uh, aspect of personality. This is, he says, very, very stable. It goes through many culture and all that, in many political uh, upweaving and all that, but race stay the same. But on the other hand, Ten sa te says also that uh, uh, race start like, uh, with, like, like they do with uh, animal species, meaning that, for instance, the influence of climate, the influence of geography is very important. And he added even the influence of uh, social and politics and history and everything. So Ten, in fact, have a kind of mixed uh, message Race is very stable, but on the other hand, race can be created. Huh? So it's like an ambivalent type of, uh, uh, of approach to the subject matter. Huh? And, and uh, Gru was very interested by, by that. He thought, well, this is uh, exactly wh what happened. And also, he had a little, a little element, if you want. He says, race are created by climate, but superior race are created by very cold climate. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> because then you have <laughs> to struggle, you know, more. And he says it's demonstrated by history that the, the, the superior race, the one who have uh, controlled the others, come from the north and not from the south. Huh? Okay, you, you see this type of, uh, of discourse uh, that you have there. And uh, it, it, that all these races, this course is always the same. Huh? It's always, we finish always at the top. Huh? The, the, the one who write the book is always in the good group. <laughs> He's never in the bad one. But okay, so Gru starts with this idea that uh, the superior race come from a cold climate and uh, with a child. And he says, we have the challenge also of the forest and all that. And, and you find th this idea, I, I find it in many, many contexts. For instance, there was a guy who's called Parkin who's one of the uh, thinker, let's say, of confederation here in Canada. And he says that, again, our uh, fantastic cold climate will discourage what he call Italian, uh, how, how you call that? The Italian, I it somewhere. Come on, say an de barbarie. I say, see these little things that, uh, uh, that make music, love. <laughs> organ grinder. Yeah, that's it. He says it, it, will, it will make the Italian uh, organ grinder and the black uh, run away from our place. Huh? And uh, it's so racist, in fact, that I, I feel closer myself to the Italian <laughs> organ grinder than the, to this idiot of parking. But, uh, <laughs> but then again, it, it's the same idea. Huh? And then I don't know by what twist of, the, uh, of his reasoning, he says, cold climate brings democracy and great values and all that. I don't know exactly why, but he, he, he affirmed that also. That not only it explains certain type, physical, if you want, but also morally, uh, it, it, can, it can define. And you have finally uh, another example of that in Drummond, uh, the famous anti-Semitic guy who opposed uh, people from the forest, from the people from the desert. Uh, People from the forest are the European, are the Aryan. And from the desert, are, of course, you, you guess it, are the Jews, uh, are the nomadic people who have no place to stay and all that. And again, it will make this type of, uh, uh, of uh, opposition. Huh? So that was, uh, I speak of this about Gru because, okay, he's discussed it. Some people like him and he says, no, he was not a racist and all that. But he's always ambivalent like this. He would speak of culture like race. He will use the two words in the, in the same phrase. And myself, I, I don't trust him. I, I don't have uh, any admiration for this guy. I find him very, very tendentious all the time. But he influenced a lot of people, and, uh, and in particular, some painter. And one of them that I show his portrait last time is Marc Aurel de Foix, Suzor Côté. Uh, and Suzor Côté, you will see, tried to create a depiction of what we could say is a Canadian, French Canadian race. I think it's one of the key of this series of pictures that he made of the habitant. Huh? 
Of course, there's other aspects. There's the aspect of that these people are workers and they come from the region where he was born and all that. But if you look uh, at uh, this, this portrait in particular of the same man, in fact, uh, one almost facing us in three-quarter view and the other in profile, and without anything in the background, are we not so far from the other representation that I was showing you just before? Huh? Like the Yaakov Lef, I would say, tradition. You do have it here again. Huh? And here, okay, this uh, Esdras seal, this uh, man, it's a portrait of a specific individual that uh, Suzanne have met and I speak with, and he liked him, and he, he asked him so many times to pose for him. We know at least 30 of this uh, depiction by Suzanne Cote. Yeah? And they are you know, everywhere. They are in all the museum uh, in, in Canada and also in the United States. They were very popular people, bought him. And he presented them, this is as a typical French Canadian. Uh, the guy who have lived all his life in this cold climate and this forest, and have created fields and, in Artabascala near, near Victoriaville, if you want, today, and uh, have created not only the land, but also the nation. Uh, and I would say this is almost an illustration of Lionel Gru theory. Uh, that's what, what uh, Suzor Cote have done. It, it's as if he did in picture what Lionel Gru was claiming to do in idea, I would say, uh, if we can call it. Uh, look, again, uh, just to give you two more examples of this depiction of this man. Here he gave his age, 82 years old. It looks very uh, uh, in prime still, very... Uh, uh, and or there almost seeing from, from behind like this, uh, what we call a profil perdu, uh, like uh, if you, you cannot see anymore the profile, but it's always him like this. I said there's 30 of them. Uh, and uh, then he made version of him also in bronze. Well, here is in plaster, but it's for making a bronze sculpture. Uh, uh, and he called it no more Monsieur Sear now. It's become Le Vieux Pionnier, uh, the, the whole pioneer. The, uh, he become a type in a way. Uh, and, and this is again, see, if, if you think of what we're seeing at the beginning, this is a portrait to become suddenly uh, a type uh, that uh, will derive toward this so-called permanent type of uh, character that will make it suddenly the type of the French Canadian uh, with the tuque and, uh, and uh, this. Uh, Mind you, I don't recognize myself in this time, but anyway. But I, I think it's what Suzor Cote uh, wanted, wanted to do. Then he made a kind of a, a full-scale version of him, you see, again, uh, without too much context. Mind you, here he suggests a little bit what this man was doing by what is what appearing on the uh, base of the sculpture. Uh, you see some instrument there, a gun and things like that, because, of course, when they go, these good men, when they, they, they go to make the land and all that, they take advantage also to hunt a little bit and to bring uh, some food at home. So he, he have suggested that also. He's lost now. He's in thought. He's an old man. Uh, he's, he's no more able to work like before. He become a type. And, and nothing, nothing good like you become an idea to be put in bronze. Uh, <laughs> When you finish as an idea, you, you are good for the bronze. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> and so that's what more or less happened here. He's, he, six years after, he decided to make a female companion to uh, the old pioneer. And uh, I put that in parallel with another, uh, not very good drawing, but by Francher. And uh, it was an illustration for Lionel Gru uh, book. Uh, uh, in which he says, all grandmother can knit even in their sleep. Huh? And uh, they continue. So, and indeed, if you look on the base here, what he suggested to give the, like, uh, the, 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 yeah, the plank of, uh, and so as much as the man is outside huh, with his gun and his, uh, his tools and all that, as much as the woman is inside. Huh? And uh, so uh, this is, again, the stereotype of domestic life for women and the uh, work, uh, the serious work is done by men outside. Huh? And uh, finally, if you want, I will leave you with this image. You see them, they are almost like book bookshelves, uh, <laughs> uh, old books in between. But uh, and they have been reproduced, of course, thousands of times. They are, they are everywhere. So they, they are, that's why it's not necessary to say this collection or that collection. You find it in many, many places. But uh, again, uh, you, you see uh, with, with these three examples, 
in which all the time the, the challenge of the painter was to find some permanent aspect in, in the individual they were representing. Well, that was a choice huh, to, to represent uh, the ethnic character. The next time we will deal with more psychological type of uh, characterization, but you will see has, has mis, mis uh, informed than, than this one here. Anyway, okay, so thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.